my great honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Harishandar Sharma. I'm absolutely sure that he, he, he needs no other introduction. He's a very well uh, known personality in the field of neuroscience, and uh, his work regarding the CNS injury and repair is uh, available all over the world, particularly regarding uh, the role of uh, nano particles and uh, the function of both the embedded. So I will kindly introduce his talk, CNS Injury and Repair, the Role of Nanomedicine, Stem Cells, Antibodies, and Other Therapeutic Agents. Right. Thank you, Nothing for this introduction. And I, I was asked to present this topic, and I will try to do justice within 23 minutes. As I told you earlier that this is a collective work and I am very happy that Swedish Strategic Force means in Swedish Strategic Research is also supporting our uh, nanoparticle program. And obviously the speaker is here, uh, National Center of Toxicological Research, USFGA, and US Air Force Research Laboratory, this is my hospital. And of course we are collaborating with Dr. Moresano from Romania uh, since 2006. Nanoscience, after 2004, there is an explosion, and still I can tell that uh, people are largely using nanomaterials in sericultures. And in the vivo studies, using nanoparticles are still not very much available uh, in the literature. So we wanted to focus a few things that these nanoparticles really influence brain function, but for that, you have to use them in vivo, no other way. The second thing is that, that these nanoparticles can even modulate pharmacological action of any compound. So we just summarized this idea in a volume in 2009. And regarding the classification of nanoparticles, uh, Bill Flicker has worked and also he was at BA and head office in Washington. Now there is different guidelines about nanoparticles and its regulation and much more uh, is coming. So according to definition, any particle can be nanoparticles if it is less than 10,000 nanometers. And they are present everywhere, in, even in this room and also outside, motor vehicle exhaust, and people are exposed to them. You cannot avoid nanoparticles. So the basic question is that what will happen if uh, the intoxication level is much more increased than the normal situation? These are the questions. Then whether it can also influence uh, disease modifying processes or the pharmacotherapy of uh, drug trees. And as you can see that this could be double-edged sword because we use nanoparticles to enhance drug delivery, but it is still strange that none of the group is interested in studying the pathological aspect of nanoparticles that are used for drug delivery. And uh, I am in the committee of European Nanomed that evaluates projects uh, for funding, and still after 50 projects evaluated, none of the projects came that suggest that we must evaluate the toxicological aspect of those nanoparticles that are being used for drug delivery. But now European Union is regulating this very strictly. So, it is our concern that as I told you earlier that uh, neuroreasterotology doesn't only mean traumatic injuries. There are many other kinds of disease that can kill human beings or affect their day-to-day -day life and cyclist stimulants abuse is one of them, hyperthermia and many more. But I will briefly describe some of these effects in short time. I have pleasure to tell you we have Dr. Stephen Scaffold here. He is Chief Editor of CNS uh, Neurological Disorders and Drug Target. And he allowed us to do a special issue in under hot topics of uh, nanoparticles, nanoneuroplasticity, um, and nanoneuropharmacology. And I'm very 
happy that uh, Nobel laureate Dr. Shelley is in physiology and medicine. And he also believed that this is the right way to go. And also in 2004, Nobel laureate also thinks about that. Some of you might be knowing uh, Dr. Ole Peter Oberson. He, he was uh, chief editor of neuroscience. Now he has become a rector, so he relinquished his position. But still, he is very pioneer in neuroscience. So you can see that these great people are feeling that we are going in right direction. Now the point is that nanoparticles are used to enhance drug delivery. It's uh, not a new thing. And for some of you not very familiar, I mean there are many nanoparticles can be used for drug delivery. So a drug can be injected in nanoparticles and then they are administered, they will release the drug. Still we do not know how these nano delivery can enhance the effect of the drug, whether it is reducing the catabolism of that particular drug, that could be one thing, or it is uh, staying there for a long period, slow release, we need to work up. This is carbon nanofiber and uh, you can also inject some drugs here and that can also be delivered. So there are various ways of this. And here is Tisha Nover uh, from 2004, Nobel laureate. We had a good discussion on this aspect. The pioneer of uh, nano wiring is Dr. Pudon Yang. He's from the University of Berkeley. And he discovered nano wiring of different metals, silica, silver, and titanium. And not only that, even stem cells can be nano wired and delivered. Well, this is not my specialty, but the uh, suggests suggest that you can nanowire stem cells. They are much more uh, effective, much more long-lasting, and can produce some good results. This is the quantum dot technology. You can also level drug, and they can pass the membrane, releasing the drug, and it stays there. While we are working also uh, together with NCTR, and this is uh, Dr. Ryan Tian. He is working at the University of Arkansas, Paysville, and he's Dr. Wang, and they are very good uh, friends. And he has uh, this patent for nano paper of titanium. And this is a structure. One can use different kinds of uh, titanium nanowire. We are using 20 to uh, 40 nanometer in uh, diameter. As I told you that these nanoparticles could be double-edged sword. So these nanoparticles or nanowires are used for drug delivery on one hand. On the other hand, if they are targeted specifically, they can even penetrate the cell units. And they can kill specific cells, like tumor cells in this case. This is not my work. This is just taken from other work. You can see the union. And you can see that tumor degeneration within cell culture can be seen using uh, nanowires. This is also a carbon nanotube, as I told you, can be used for drug labeling. But what we are using, titanium nanowire, with the help of Dr. Ryan Tian from the University of Arkansas. And he told me that when he labels this drug, I don't understand this picture very well, but he thinks that the drug labeling is quite good. There are a few questions we need to answer. That we should not believe that if we level any compound to nanowire, whatever it is, it is doing good. That is one question. The second question is that, is there any time limit? For example, if we inject any drug nanowiring, it is working for always or all the time? But here is the question here. This is spinal cord injury, T9 and T12. We have used nanowired XYZ drug, not very concerned here. The idea is that, that after application of five minutes of spinal cord injury and one hour, you can see that there is still difference. So nanowired drug delivery is not a panacea for everything. It is a specific pharmacotherapy. It also follows the biological rule. And these are controlled situations and these are untreated in children. This is what the same thing we can see leakage of iodine, and you can see here five minutes and one hour. There are certain differences. 
and they are producing good results, but also the timing is important. This is the same case with events and leakage. Then the second question comes, as I told you, if we have four drugs, for example, with different capacity of having your protection, the nanowires, all the drugs, do we get very similar results irrespective of whatever drugs we are using? Or still, we can see the difference. This slide shows the same thing. This is starting with pain, and the rats can walk normally, so they have this great. Laminar tummy can produce slight changes, not much. But spinal cord injury, the scale is very down. These are different drugs. This drug, we know that it is quite potent, and you can see that after three hours, it produces much better results than the other drugs. So the answer is that nanowiring can enhance the capacity of the drug, but probably not change its pharmacological characteristics. The time oops. The same thing we are used at different time intervals after, and you can see that the drug that is doing good, it is always doing good. Uh, but even if we add, there is some effect of adding, but it not change the complete pharmacotherapy. So one should not understand that nano delivery of the drug can do anything and all drugs will become equal, whether they are good or bad. This is the analysis provided by the drug companies for which we have used the drug and I do not understand in detail also, but there are four compartments and we can see that untreated is most injured and this is one drug leveled with nanowire. So they are here, means much more damage. This is the area that is most neural protection, and you can see that this drug is here in this compartment, whereas the other drugs were in between. So the point is that the differences will remain, but they take potentiates. Electron microscopy here shows that this is untreated and this is nanowire treated. You can see that myelin is very well preserved and motor neurons are very near to the north. So it means that they are doing something. I am not showing because of time the uh, drug is out and for countries. So at this point we can say that although we understand that nanowiring has enhanced its effect, but we require more understanding. Nanotoxicity, and this is in, in vivo situation, we did some work and one big treatment of silver nanoparticles, you can see this leakage of the one too, and it is quite deeper. So it has also been a component of nanotoxicity. At the cellular level, we use here copper and silver, two identical size, 50 to 60 nanometers, because this is quite common that whether we use nanoparticles, say carbon, uh, copper, anything of one size, probably it will have same effect. But here, this copper and silver produces aluminum leakage. I mean, this is, I'm showing only one example. You can see that the magnitude and uh, uh, intensity of aluminum in two different cases in red brain are different. Likewise, this astrocytic activation by GFA. So by looking at this picture, one can still say that there could be differences in different types of nanoparticles. Then, we want to study at electron microscopy. <coughs> and what we can see here that copper, this is myelin vesiculation in, in normal cases, <coughs> no injury in here. Silver, this myelin is much more vesiculated. It's the expression of heat shock protein and ultrastructural changes. So it produces changes that can also be visible at ultrastructural level. Now, I have to come to the other part, the antibodies. <coughs> and antibodies, we are using the idea that uh, because of uh, lack of time, I'm not going to those literature, but uh, there are literature that, for example, serotonin has seven receptor and subtypes. If you want to block the action of serotonin, you could have multiple drugs. But if you use serotonin antiserum, probably it can bind to certain areas and block the action of so, there are good evidences 
that some cases monoclonal antibodies could be much more effective than receptor binding drugs. So we, we just tested our hypothesis using a select antibody of different neurodestructive agents. I will show you some results. Spinal cord injury, serotonin antibodies applied topically here. You can see that uh, it is quite better than the spinal cord in untreated. And when there is neuroprotection, you can also see that leakage of iodine come, uh, is less and edema is also less. So we, we can understand that probably serotonin is harmful agent when allowed to increase after trauma, it produces adverse effects. Therefore, antibodies applied here in this case over the traumatized spinal cord can be used within five hours. Then we also tried in another model of head injury. I mean, these are some classical pictures of description of head injury. No need to go on. And here I must mention that nowadays we have some discussion about cognitive impairment. And this is the latest report. There is no politics about that. But uh, in Afghanistan, one of the uh, US soldiers has killed so many people. And the reason is that probably he was badly head injured. And therefore, it is believed that when there is head injury, even after treatment, the mental function will change. These are just theories. And to this audience, I need not tell that the progression of brain injury induced changes will occur depending on the areas of the brain involved. For example, there are different kinds of injury affecting different regions will have different effect. So, just to test our hypothesis, we have two different models of uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. One is head injury, where we apply this way over here. It produces 0.2 to 4 newton impact on top. It's closed head injury, no fracture. And then we compare with open injury, when the skull is open and making a lesion. These two injuries are entirely different. I don't have time to tell you. Then we applied serotonin antibody in this model intracerebroventricularly and I can tell you that the serotonin antibodies were neuroprotective, the neuronal cell changes were quite good, but here when there is no fracture, if you apply injury on right side, the left side is much more damaged, probably this is a model of contract. Here is an example of open brain injury, this is uh, the lesion. You can see here, within five hours, we apply antibodies to nitric oxide in base and you see by yourself that this leakage is uh, in is quite wet. There are some questions. If you apply antibodies over the brain or the spinal cord, that is peripheral. Or that is able to stop its antigen in, in vivo situation. The point is very clear here that this is the picture from the spinal cord, nitric oxide in base of regulation. And after application of the antibody, you can see that there is no NOS of regulation. You can say that there are the same antibodies applied, but I can say in this way that no upregulation can be seen. One type of conclusion can be made from this observation that antibodies could penetrate. And there are evidences that within 10 minutes they can penetrate within the spinal cord. And these are different parameters that when the antibodies penetrate, they can also be then we identified another neurodestructive agent is dynorphin. The dynorphin has different varieties and since we are working in Oxal University in Sweden where Lars Sterigius was there, obviously we have interest in dynorphin and this is dynorphin A, 1 to 17. And you can see here this picture that when dynorphin is applied after spinal cord injury, this spinal cord is much better here. And we can also trace it at the evoke potential I showed you here, immediate loss of evoke potential and here, here you can see that dynorphin antibody was able to start. So this is the electrophysiological signal and this is other parameters, morphological changes. Now, there are discussions about TNF-alpha and cytokine. There are two papers probably from uh, Dr. Pan and Abacast in group that uh, TNF-alpha might be neuroprotective and this will be true. 
But majority of papers published showing that TNM alpha has some neurodestructive properties. It was very difficult to look at this, so we used <coughs> TNM alpha antisense. This is different, minus 30 minutes, 2 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes. And then this is the application of TNF alpha. <coughs> we have studied two things. Motor neuron damage and upregulation of nitric oxides in brain. And of course changes in neuropathy. The point is that normally we believe that if we pre-treat or block before injury, it is always going to be better. So far this was true with uh, serotonin antibodies, uh, nitric oxides and pain antibodies. But here, if we prevent applying TNF alpha minus 30 minutes up to 10 minutes, we have adverse effects. But if we apply after 10 minutes and survival period is 5 hours, it has good So the point is that, that even there are certain compounds or certain factors present in vivo situation, their presence is required before injury. If we block them before injury, it could have adverse effects. This is just what we have started and it's very preliminary. I don't want to go into detail where we have applied some stem cell nanowires. And you can see that these nanowires as capacity just mildly penetrate across the cell and without harming them. And we have a model of uh, diabetes and we try to see how it works. And nowadays it is quite clear that cognitive functions are affected, especially in hippocampus, we have uh, previous papers, and in diabetes. This is an example that the stem cells can grow even on nanowires, that is quite clear. And these are the examples. tried in combination that diabetes aggravates the neurotoxicity, nanoparticles, fetal stress and spinal cord injury. I will not show all the results. Then we also tried how many minutes I have? Okay. Then we also tried uh, to reduce this uh, neurotoxicity by diabetes. The model is septal reducing and even we have used methamphetamine after that. These are only experimental situations. And then we have nanowire defender and also defender. What you can see that if you apply nanowire BDNF and GDNF, the glucose level were not affected. But you can see that leakage of uh, iodine here in this case is really influenced by nanowire than the parent compounds after metamphetamine. And here they are working much better. These, these are the nanowires, these are the normal compounds and these pain modules. And these are the changes in sodium and potassium electrolytes. And the point is that sodium also increase, always increases when there is very edema, potassium decreases, and sometimes chloride do not change. But the nanowire drug was, was most efficient in uh, regulating, regulating the uh, water level. And here is the distorted neuron. And you can see here that nanowire will be most effective. And here is the combination of methamphetamine and diabetes. Here you can see that neurons were almost much more degenerated. And here is methamphetamine alone. 
and then this is the effect of nanowire BDNF, minute after diabetes and BDNF alone. And this is here. I'm not going in detail about hypothermia because of lack of time. But these are these are the stems that were prepared. I, I have not done by myself, but they say that it is quite pure. And then they were nanowired here and delivered. And this is the hypothermia induced pathology. In diabetes, you can see that nanowires they are much better preserved than a stem cell alone. It's a very preliminary study. And also in hypothermia and here with diabetes and the stem cell alone and nanowires stem cell is much better in preventing these are acute experiments of four hours. And these are some only uh, graphical representation that heat stress is here, diabetes is here, and always nanowire drug is helping much better. There are only three slides about this, about drug and barrier permeability is the most effective. So we can only summarize that nanowire drugs are effective. Nanowire stem cell delivery is better than alone. And, but we have to go much more ahead or find out what is the real mechanism. But we believe that future is right. And uh, uh, this ROI was you know, supported by former uh, uh, education minister of Sweden, Thomas Ostros. And of course we have some connection from India. And these are our supporters. Thank you very much for your kind energy. Thank you so much for this uh, outstanding presentation, very informative, and uh, I think will stimulate discussion, this uh, important talk. So, questions for Professor Sharma. Yes. Yes, Hari. Uh, and thinking about the delivery of these materials, there's been a lot of concern over the years about being able to reach through the blood-brain barrier and reach the central nervous system with nanomaterials. And I know the folks at University of Michigan have had a great deal of difficulty getting some of their, their products that they want to get in, sensors and that sort of thing, into the nervous system. So uh, what do you think is going to make the difference in, in the ability to get these products in and to do the in vivo experiments to verify that indeed you can get, uh, when you want to, you can get your nanomaterials uh, in, into, the, into the central nervous system, into a target uh, that would be most appropriate, a, a particular location within the brain? Yeah, it is a very good question. And we have many problems regarding nano delivery. The first thing that if a drug is leveled on nano wire, if you inject intravenously, it is unclear that what portion of it reaches to the brain circulation and out of that, how much the drug is delivered at certain point. To overcome this point, 